title of the message tonight is Thankful in 2020. And you can pretty much probably assume what I mean by that. Uh, I was looking at a bunch of memes. You've seen memes for over the year, over the, this past couple months about the year 2020. And uh, let me just give you a few of them that I like. There's a whole bunch of them, you know. It's one thing that we've, it's kind of our society's involved into this point where, you know, when things are frustrating and life gets hard or whatever, just make a meme about it and post it on social media. <laughs> but anyway, here's some memes uh, that I saw on Facebook about 2020. One says, uh, has a first picture, says, me being prepared for 2020, guy in a suit of armor, got his sword, you know, everything is protected except a little, little slit right here so he can see. And then it says 2020, and it's got an arrow that found its way in that little slit. <laughs> One of them says, uh, question, if 2020 was a drink, what would it be? And the answer, colonoscopy prep. <laughs> if you don't understand that, you're too, you're too young. <laughs> I've never had one. Either, but anyway, uh, here's another one. It says, 2020 is a unique leap year. It has 29 days in February, 300 days in March, and five years in April. <laughs> Obviously, that was written in April. Uh, there was another one where this boy is just showing the first picture. He's like, ah, the second picture, he's got heads down. And it says, teenagers in the future trying to learn all the things that happened in 2020 for their history final. <laughs> Ratings, one out of five stars, 2020. It says, very bad, would not recommend. <laughs> okay, one has a picture. I don't know, this was popular here a while back. You remember when they tried to uh, storm Area 51? That was a big thing. And it's got a picture of the reporter and the guy's running behind him and he's running like this, which is some kind of weird uh, anime reference. I don't completely understand it. And he's running behind that. So it kind of became a meme. And it says, the world was fine until we decided to raid Area 51. Just saying. <laughs> I think that's kind of funny. There's uh, one where this guy's drinking coffee out of a cup and uh, the cup, I think, is supposed to be some kind of cat or something like that. And so its ears are sticking up. But it kind of looks like uh, a little knife or something sticking up out of the cup. And it shows him taking a drink. And the, and the <laughs> knife part's going right into his eye. And it says, ah, yes, a nice cup of 2020. <laughs> okay. Well, one says, and if you don't understand this reference, you trust me, you don't want to know anymore. But it says, I cannot believe Tiger King was the most normal part of 2020. <laughs> My family knows who Tiger King is because uh, we went to that place before anybody knew who he was, and we didn't know who he was, and we went to that uh, place. But anyway, that's a long story. Last one is a bag of chips. It says, if 2020 was a bag of chips, and it's Lay's, and the flavor is orange juice and toothpaste. <laughs> that's 2020 if it was a bag of chips. So <clears throat> we understand 2020 has been a bad year. A lot of people making jokes about it and making fun of it. Uh, and really, it's devastated some people. Businesses have shut down. People have lost their jobs, lost a big portion of money. And uh, really, in many ways, it's made our, our nation kind of go insane, it seems like to me. And I've, I've noticed here lately, I'm, I just, just this last week, I saw articles. Po now, I, I, under I read the articles of mainstream media just to see like what they're putting out there. Right. I'm very skeptical because it's we're living in a weird time where they uh, feel they uh, censor everything that's put out there. And it's like they're really forcing one view on everybody. OK, we understand that. Uh, but I look at it and it's just interesting that the latest media is about this vaccine, this coronavirus vaccine that they're coming out with. And, uh, you know, one day it's like, hey, good news. The vaccine is now, however, whatever percentage effective. Uh, and, uh, and less side effects and all this kind of stuff. And so uh, it's back and forth on how, how much we can, you know, put our faith in this vaccine. It's kind of up in the air. Of course, I'm not taking one. <laughs> I, we kind of, we're against even taking the flu shot. And, uh, and we know some people in our church that don't have that. And there's, you know, three people in our church this year that took the flu shot and immediately got sick. They said, I don't know. It's just like I got this. Some flu and they had it for like three weeks. I'm like, wouldn't you rather just get the flu? <laughs> right? but, uh, but they did that. But anyway, 
so my mind's thinking, well, why would I want to insert, you know, the COVID in me? I know that's not exactly how it works, but still, uh, you're going to get the side effects. Another article comes up on my feed, and it's, and it's uh, somebody saying, doctors are warning that the side effects of the vaccine are no walk in the park. Okay, but they're saying take it, but just know that the side effects are not going to necessarily be easy. And then another one comes up, like I think it was yesterday, where this doctor says, and this is just mainstream, I'm talking like, like CNN or something like that, I don't know, like a mainstream media article. And this doctor is, expert is what it called, this expert is saying, don't overthink it when it comes out, <laughs> just take it. Don't overthink, I, I promise you, that's a, like a quote, don't overthink it just take it. And I'm like, how does our society just like a bunch of sheep just saying, hey, whatever they tell me to do, you know? And then the ones that say, wait a minute, there's something wrong with this. They're like, ah, you're just a rebel and, you know, trying to cause problems. And, and so from my perspective, the world's gone insane, right? And so sometimes as, as Christians, we can uh, look at that and think, man, what kind of America am I living in? And we can get real uh, upset about that. The country's divided like never before, it seems. Uh, be, if it's not about the COVID situation and whether you should wear a mask or not wear a mask or whatever, I mean, it's just kind of crazy. The division, then it's about, uh, you know, the, the, and the parties, obviously left and right, and you got riots and you got people, uh, you know, uh, obviously police and, and uh, Black Lives Matters and all that. It's been a crazy year and there's no indication of it getting better in 2021. <laughs> Right. I really don't see it getting any better. And so most, you know, likely we got uh, a new president in the next four years and people are thinking, oh, what in the world are we going to what kind of surprises are we in for in 2021? You know, so uh, it can be distressing. It can be, you know, bring a lot of fear or whatever. And not only that, what I've noticed this year, uh, if you keep up on some of our friends, uh, in the different uh, groups that are out there, preaching groups or whatever, there's been a lot of division. People kind of like uh, leaving each other and going to different uh, different uh, parties, if you will, and different sects and and uh, and, and kind of turning on other people, saying, hey, we don't like this guy anymore, whatever. It's happened a lot this year. Uh, and it's really been, it can be depressing if you're not, you know, if you're not careful. I remember whenever I was going to BBC in Springfield, and it had a lot of problems. I knew that when I went in there, I knew that after I was there for a little while, I wasn't gonna stay there. I didn't like some of the teachings and different things that, that was going on. But I remember when there was what some would call a split where uh, a lot of people left that college and I ended up leaving that college as well and going to Heartland in Oklahoma City. And it seemed like a split. And I remember this feeling, uh, you know, I was going through some personal things in my life with my parents and stuff like that too during that time. Uh, and, uh, no, I think that was a little bit later. That's besides the point. And so, uh, but anyway, I remember feeling like, you know, my, my parents had divorced, right? And I'm not talking about my real parents. I'm talking about in, in, in the Bible colleges. I'm like, whoa, you know, everyone's split. And like, I know we disagree and we have different methodology and different things going on, but this group left that group. And now they're suing each other, calling each other names. I mean, there's all kind of weird stuff going on. The president of the college got up and made this huge announcement, just blasting, uh, you know, Brother Sam Davison for, for, you know, some of his views. And, and uh, I remember just being in turmoil inside thinking, oh, man. And this is what I feel like is going on in our country and in the churches and, and different preacher friends that we have and, and everything. And, uh, and it can be a little discouraging. Hey, let's just rewind and do 2020 all over again. You know, it's, it's been crazy. And, uh, and then, to top it all off, at Iola, we've had three deaths this year. Three deaths. Not corona-related, coronavirus-related, but it happened during this time, which made it difficult on some of the you know, funeral service and some of the different arrangements and all that kind of stuff. We had three of our older, our precious older folks uh, pass away, and you think, man, what's going on? This has been a crazy year. And probably some people in here or people that you know, your family members, whatever, have gone through stuff even beyond that that we don't know about. And it's been a challenging year for them, maybe lost loved ones or had some hard times. Uh, I don't know, but there's a lot of bad uh, stuff. It's a bad time in general. 
2020, a lot of people think of it like those memes. You know, this is the worst year, whatever. Now, when we get to uh, the story of Joseph here, I'll, read, I'll go back to read a little bit of that here in a second. It makes me think of Pollyanna. Now, if you don't know who Pollyanna is, in 1913, there was a book written, I think that's right here, a, a, a book written about this girl, and then later on movies were made about her. It had this uh, a fictional character, but movies that she was just an orphan girl, had a really rough life, and she tried to look at the positive on everything. So bad things would happen in her life, and she would she would kind of turn that to good, and everybody just marveled, like, what is this little girl? You know, why is she looking at everything and uh, and and uh, and being so happy whenever things are really bad in her life? And so uh, uh, in the book. I'm not, I can't remember if this was in the movie or not, but in the book, she explained this game that she played called the Glad Game, all right? And, uh, and the story, I think, goes when she was in the orphanage, she, uh, she was wanting a little baby doll. And instead, uh, it was like a mission, like giving or something like that, and she was able to get something. And instead of getting the baby doll, she looked, and all that was left is a pair of crutches. And if the story goes, I think it was her dad or somebody... Uh, I don't know. I can't think of this story because I don't understand why she was an orphan if her dad was around. But I guess her dad taught her, or maybe this is before she was an orphan. Orphan, I don't know. But her dad said, "Well, just look on the bright side. You know, you got those crutches, and at least you don't have to use them." And so uh, this uh, just attitude of saying, "Hey, just look on the bright side. Look for the positive. Look at the good." And in Genesis fifty twenty. It seems like Joseph had that Pollyanna spirit. Okay, look at verse 20, or let's start at verse 19. So Genesis 50, verse 19. And you know all that Joseph had gone through. Everybody in here knows the story, uh, the betrayal. Uh, they were going to kill him. They didn't kill him. They sold him into slavery. Now he's in Egypt uh, being a servant and a slave. And, and, and then, of course, God raises him to a position of power. And now his brothers think, oh, no, he's going to want to kill us. Okay, verse 19, Joseph said unto them, Fear not, for am I in the place of God? But as for you, ye thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good, to bring to pass, as it is this day, to save much people alive. And so he's leaving it up into God's hands, and he's saying, Hey, situation, I'm not going to take it out on you, and I'm going to say, Hey, God, allowed all this to happen to, for a reason. I mean, look where I am now. Now, some people wouldn't say, hey, look, I'm the most one of the most powerful people in the la land, and God's blessed me and, and prospered me. No, some people would say, man, I've been in the Egypt all this time and away from my family. My own family betrayed me and all that kind of stuff, and they would just li live in the negative and not think about the fact that, hey, God has brought you and He's prepared you and He's protected you and He's got you to this place and he's done it for a reason. Now Joseph sees what that reason probably is. He says, hey, the whole you know, nation here is, is in famine, and, uh, and, and they don't have food, but God has allowed us to store up lots of food, and now I can bring my family here, and they can stay alive, and we can save much people. Sure. And then, of course, years later, we see that brings them into bondage where they're in Egyptian slavery. <laughs> and it's like, do you really think that was a good thing? Well... You follow the story, and you see uh, there were definitely good things that came out of it. You know, the story of Moses could have looked at it as a terrible thing about how Moses was taken from his family and had to be raised there in, in, in Pharaoh's house and all that stuff, but look how God used it. And so, uh, so it seems like Joseph takes this kind of attitude. And so I'm going to give you four or five, I think four reasons uh, why we can be thankful in 2000, 2020. Let me get back in order here. All right. Just a simple message why we can be thankful in 2020. Okay. Number one, this, let's be honest. This is the first thing that I think about uh, in these times. We're talking about how bad of a year it is. For some, I'm sure it's been devastating. But let's be honest, as a whole, don't you think it could be a lot worse? <laughs> it could be a whole lot worse. I mean, I'm thinking in my mind about, uh, you know, World War II times and the Great Depression and, and uh, different parts of the world where they're, you know, they're genocide and there's all these different things. And I'm thinking, look, 
things could be a lot worse, you know. And so we look around at the blessings we have and some liberties that still remain. <laughs> and we say, look, we actually are living in a good place at a bad time, there's, that's for sure, but there's some good things. And so it might not sound encouraging necessarily, but think about it, and things could be a lot worse. And not only that, we know that there are going to be rougher times than this for us. You know, some people lost their job. I'm just talking about myself here and probably most people in here that I think of. I didn't lose my job, right? Some people lost loved ones and family. I didn't lose anybody. You know, I, things haven't really been that tough for me. You know, the worst thing I have to do is just fight people who want me to conform to a different, <laughs> different uh, uh, mandates or whatever. That's not that tough. Aren't you glad we have the freedom to even express that or the freedom to uh, protest these things or whatever? Uh, it's really not that tough, but we know that things are going to get tough. John 16, Jesus said this. He said, These things I have spoken unto you, that in me ye might have peace. And here's what he said. This is a promise. He said, In the world ye, ha ye shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. And of course, when he's talking about tribulation there, he's saying just rough times. You're going to have bad times in this world, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Who was he talking to? He's talking to his disciples. Do you know the persecution that they went through? Do you know, you know, uh, we don't see it in the Bible, all of these stories. We know some of them were put to death. Uh, history says that all of them pretty much were, uh, were martyred for their faith. Uh, certainly we look at the records of things that went on in that time and the people that were killed for their faith and all that. And we say, aren't you glad we don't, we're not living through that right now? Uh, you know, but Jesus says, hey, those times are going to happen. Look at Matthew chapter 5. Uh, it doesn't sound encouraging at, fir you know, at first to think, oh, you're, you're promising bad times are going to happen. Yeah, but he says, be of good, of good cheer. I've overcome the world. So he's promising that, yeah, it's... It's inevitable. You can't help it. Bad times are going to come. But if you just can't keep walking in him, you know, yoke up with him, he's going to get you through the rough times. It's a promise. Chapter uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 44. Again, Jesus talking here. He says, But I say unto you, love your enemies, bless them that curse you, you, and pray for them which despitefully use you and persecute you, that ye may be the children of your Father which is in heaven. For he maketh his Son to rise uh, on the evil and on the good, and sendeth rain on the just and the unjust. You say, well, it's, it's hard to love those people that I hate. It's hard for me to, you know, do good to my enemies and whatever. And it's like, if you really stop and think about it, God has to allow good things to happen to evil people every day. <laughs> he allows the sun and the rain to come upon the just and the unjust. This is part of it. He allows some good things to happen, some bad things to happen. There are things, I mean, read the book of Ecclesiastes and you'll see Solomon's view on this thinking, hey, there's some things that just happen to all of us that we can't avoid. You know, these are just natural things that are going to happen. But 1 Thessalonians 4:13. I love this. We always read this at funerals because it's encouraging for those people who lose a loved one and they have hope. They have hope that the world doesn't have. It says, but I would not have you be ignorant, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not. And here's what it says, even as others which have no hope. Okay, so the world should look at 2020. We, sh we should expect the world to look at 2020 and say, what a terrible time. I mean, what is the point? Why go on? I mean, I heard suicide for a while was up because people didn't want to quarantine, you know, were sick of quarantining and sick of all the, the depression. I mean, we, we went through uh, Burlington where the, the hospital that we're going to go to on Monday and, and we drove through that town. I don't know. Maybe it's a good town. Maybe it's a nice town, but it was overcast. Everybody's shut down. Everybody you see walking on the streets has got masks on or face suffocators on. <laughs> and they're walking down, and it's just like uh, there you can see. Well, you can't see their faces because they have masks on, but it just looks like everyone's depressed, and they're walking around, and I'm thinking, whoa, this is just a gloomy town, right? Well, we can expect the world's going to be like that in rough times, but as Christians, that shouldn't be the case. As Christians, we know that we've overcome with, through Jesus Christ. And so the Bible says, we sorrow not even as others that have no hope. Uh, if happens, maybe your closest loved ones die, 
Praise the Lord, I haven't had to go through that as far as my, uh, my mom, dad, my wife, my kids. I uh, haven't had them die to me. That's the worst thing I can think of, right, is one of them dying. The hurt, I can't exp- I understand how that would feel, okay? But in the worst times, the Bible says that the world, you know, their, their sorrow leads, leads to death. But godly sorrow, you know, for the saints leads to repentance and it leads to trusting God and, and just understanding uh, Him. Our, we don't have uh, sorrow even as others who, who, who have no hope. Yeah. Number one, to be honest, it could be. We know the destination. That's the hope. I, I don't understand anyone that would teach a gospel that didn't include eternal salv- eternal security. You know, I don't understand that. We preach it at the door because this is, seems to be a huge factor on people understanding that salvation is eternal. And I think if I'm not preaching eternal security, I'm not preaching good news at all <laughs> because people are going to live in fear thinking I could lose my salvation, uh, you know. And so we are trying to show them that a gift of salvation is eternal. Because when you really understand that you grasp that and you've been born again, you're a child of God, you're rest and secure. You're sealed unto the day of redemption. And so you have this hope that, man, I don't have to worry about that. Bad things might happen. I might even fall into sin, God forbid, an open sin that everybody knows about. But you know what? I haven't lost my salvation. You know, I'm going to get disciplined. I'm going to get chastened by the hand of God if I do that but I know I haven't lost my salvation, and that's encouraging. We don't have to live in fear every day of our life. And so uh, we know we will reach our destination. If everything else fails, if we die, we know where we're going. And there's nothing to be more grateful about than our salvation and the salvation of our loved ones. Uh, You know, it's, it's good to know all your children are saved. It's good to know... Uh, you, you know, for uh, grandparents, I know they a lot, oftentimes, I think of Mrs. Uh, uh, Cormay Collins, Valerie's grandma, uh, and she just keeps track on all of her family members, just waiting and for the day they get saved and praying for them. And she just, you know, because you want to know that everybody in your family is saved and going to heaven. And so, uh, so there's no greater feeling, you know, <clears throat> to know that no matter what happens in this world, I know I'm going to heaven. I know my loved ones are going to heaven. I'm going to see them again. And uh, this is why Job could say, though he slay me, yet will I trust in him. You know, this is a great piece that you say, man, I don't know why God's allowing me to go through this. But you know what? He's the one that's going to give me eternal life. And so I'm going to trust in him no matter. Paul says similar thing. Paul says, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. I'm going to live for Christ no matter what I suffer through, no matter what the trials and tribulations happen in this life. I'm going to live for Christ. And when I die, I know that's even better, right? And so this is a a wonderful blessing for the Christians. And the reason why we can be thankful in 2020 or any time, no matter how bad times get, we can be thankful. Number three, being thankful in 2020, we not only know how the story ends, but while we're here, you ever feel like you're just kind of like, you know, you're, you're waiting for your destination. The Bible even says we're pilgrims and strangers in this land, right? So it gives you this idea like we're on a journey. We're on a, a, a trip, if you will, going through this world, right? But here's the cool thing is that God gave us the Bible. While we're on this trip, like this is our like map, right? We, as we're going through the destination, now we know where we're going to end. We're going to end in heaven. Uh, but meanwhile, we're going through this life. He didn't just leave us blind. He gave us the map. And I, and I heard one preacher say this one time. He said, actually, it's not really like a map. It's more like a GPS. You're following the instructions, and you're going the way you're supposed to go. And sometimes you get off course a little bit, and it's like recalculating, <laughs> recalculating. Wait a minute. All right, now you messed up, but hey, now I'm going to take you this way. Or, or hey, whenever you can, take a U, make a U-turn. You know what I mean? It's like a GPS, right? Because we're following the Holy Spirit as He leads us through His Word. And, uh, and, and praise the Lord. We have uh, the Word of God to live by. Now, here's the thing. If you're not in the Word of God, you won't have that. that you'll be unstable, right? You'll be restless. Uh, it's, this is an amazing thing, okay? This, is a, this was encouraging, but I had a brother call me the other day, and I'm going to expose to you a little secret, okay? 
Not everybody knows this about Pastor Rocky, but I take baths, okay? <laughs> one present my wife got me one time for Christmas was a little tray that you put on your bath. And I, that sounds really sissy, I know, but <laughs> a little tray you put on your bath where you could, not bubble bath or anything like that. Just as, and you could soak in the hot tub. I put my Bible on there, my coffee and all that. A lot of times I like to do that, and I'll just have some time reading my Bible, my daily Bible reading or whatever, uh, study, maybe thinking about some some things that are coming up and some preaching. And I'll sit there and I'll read my Bible for like an hour till I'm nice and wrinkly. And, and, uh, all right, I'm embarrassed telling you guys that. But anyway, so the other day I'm in the bath and I'm reading my Bible, and I'm reading through Romans. That's where we are in our our, our daily Bible reading. Now, obviously, as a pastor, you you got to read ahead because you're planning for sermons and and maybe you're reading a lot of different other areas in the Bible. But I try to follow along where everybody else is. We got a, a Bible reading schedule, and uh, and the idea is that everybody will read it. And then I try to, as often as I can, preach from something that happened during that, you know, those chapters that you read that last week. And so anyway, I'm reading through uh, Romans, and I get through Romans six, and I'm just seeing things. I've read it a thousand times, you know, but I'm reading through that with kind of a fresh eye and some things are really jumping out to me, uh, out at me. And I'm saying, man, this is really good. I don't know if I'm going to preach on this pretty soon or what, but I'm just reading this with the fresh eyes and saying, man, this is, this is just great. And then, uh, I moved on to something else. And I was thinking about something that brother Justin and I talked about last week. And I said, you know what? I was going to study that out. This would be a good time. And actually in that Bible reading, there was a, one of the things we talked about, so that triggered another thought. That's how your Bible study goes, isn't it? Or am I the only one? <laughs> okay. So I did my regular reading, and then I tried to uh, look at some other things. And then I get a phone call. Now, it's embarrassing to be in the bath, so i got to be real still so I don't swash the water, and then he knows I'm in the bath. <laughs> but I answered, and it was a brother calling me saying, hey, I really need some advice. Here's what's going on in my life. And he began to tell me what's going on and the troubles and the trials. And as he's talking, I kid you not, everything he's saying is exactly what I just got done reading in Romans 6. And I was able to tell him, man, you don't understand. It's like God just prepared me for this very phone call, which is really going to be encouraging because this is kind of things that we were talking about is just my I just don't feel like God's working in my life I don't you know I don't understand what's the what's the magical formula you know to know you're in God's will and all that stuff boom it was right there it's exactly what I'm saying and so here's what I want to say to you when you are in God's word and you're following the Holy Spirit and he's showing you different steps in your life you're going to start noticing in life everything's falling into place and you're like, hey, this is exactly what God wants me to do. Hey, this is exactly what I'm supposed to be studying right now. This is exactly, you know, uh, you are on the right course. And boy, that brings so much peace and happiness. Not everybody has that, I know. And, and even Christians who aren't in the Word, they're not, uh, you know, trying to, they're not trying to pray and, and live for the Lord and get those things right. They might not experience that. But man, as a Christian, you've got it. You, you certainly don't have an excuse. You know, it's right there. All you got to do is pick it up and read it and pray for guidance from the Holy Spirit. But we have got uh, the roadmap, if you will, or the or the GPS. Uh, let me see. And not only that, we got the navigator, the Holy Spirit, right, helping guiding us along the way. Uh, even the GPS isn't enough for me. I've got to have my wife sitting in the next seat, and the, the GPS says, "Hey, get in the right lane." And I zone out and I don't get in the right lane. And then my wife is in the passenger seat saying, hey, he said, she said, get in the right lane, get in the right lane, get in the right lane. That's kind of how the Holy Spirit does. It's like we read it in the Bible, but it's just like zoning out. And then the Holy Spirit will go, boom, you know, you got to do this. Anyway, that's just kind of my application there. So, uh, so anyway, uh, that conversation with this brother that called me, it was just it's been such a blessing to me. Hopefully it was a blessing to him that God was speaking to me through His Word and through the Holy Spirit for just that time. And if you stay prepared in God's Word, you prepare, He is going to bring somebody to you. And this is the, this is the glory of uh, being a soul winner. If you know how to present the gospel and you're ready for it and you're studied up and you uh, want to give somebody the gospel, I mean, you just want to, it's inside you. You know what God's going to do? He's going to bring somebody your way that needs to hear the gospel. We see it all the time. And we've got back there the map. You can see we're strategically hitting these areas and we're trying to mark it. And the goal is to knock every door in the Kansas City metro. But you know as well as I do, most of the people that we went to the Lord was just an unscheduled, I shouldn't say most of the people, but oftentimes it's just an unscheduled house 
Uh, sometimes we've hit the wrong door. Sometimes somebody's walking down the street. Sometimes somebody's sitting in their car, and the Holy Spirit's kind of like, hey, that person needs to hear the gospel. And we've heard stories where they say, man, you don't believe. I was just praying about that, or I was just, you know, just the other day somebody told me something, and I've been thinking about that. Uh, when the COVID thing first broke out and everybody was worried and thought they were going to die, we would have people at their door say, man, I've been thinking a lot about death lately you know, because of the, what's the, the scare of the media and everything. So the Lord will use that if you will stay in his word and treat it like your, your life's map, if you will, or GPS. Finally, uh, here's another thing. Why we should be thankful, 2020. He has also, believe it or not, no matter what you're going through, how rough things seem to be, he has given us all the resources we need. He's given everything that we need. I already mentioned the Word of God, that's for sure. Not only that, He has given us, He provides for His children. And look at this. You say, well, I'm dirt poor. You don't understand. Yeah, but He, he provides the money that we need. He provides the wealth that we need when we need it. All right, I can, I can testify to that for sure. <laughs> when you need it, it's there, right? Now, I'm not talking about a magical, you know, just be stupid with your money and just throw all reason away. But I'm talking about when you're serving the Lord, you're trying to do what he wants you to do. He's going to provide for you what you need to do that. OK, uh, how about health? You say, well, I'm not very healthy. I'm sick. I got this problem. I got that problem. Yeah, you're healthy enough to do what he wants you to do. He's going to provide you enough health, you know, to get through whatever situation. You say, what if I die? Well, to live as Christ, to die is gain, <laughs> right? But for the most part, it's understood. God's going to get you through these different things. He's got a job for you. He's got something he wants you to do. He's going to provide for you, okay? And then, uh, and then not just our, our wealth and our health, but even friends. He's got influences in his life. Another thing I talked to about the brother that called me uh, when I was studying is I said, well, here's what you need. You need to be around friends who are going to encourage you and point you to the Word of God. If you're not, you're never going to succeed in those kinds of things. Okay, and so he will give us friends. They're there. They're available. You say, ah, nobody cares about me. There's people out there that care about you, right? And he's provided us with those friends that we need. In uh, chapter 4. Actually, if you get there, hold your place and go to Psalms. We're going to come back to Philippians, but go to Psalms first. Psalm 37. Psalm 37, look at verse 23. Now, we understand there's none good but God. We understand we're all sinners. Uh, we understand that. But oftentimes the Bible talks about a righteous man or a just man or a good man. It doesn't mean perfect. It doesn't mean without sin. Of course, it just means somebody who is righteous in God's eyes, like Noah was. Or, you know, uh, even Lot is called a righteous man. It vex they vexed his righteous soul. And you're like, Lot? Righteous? Yeah, he was, he was righteous. He was a believer and he was saved. And it wasn't his own righteousness, but he was counted as righteous for his faith, just like every other believer. It says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, and he delighteth in his way. Verse 24, though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. Look at verse 25. I have been young, and now I'm old, yet have I not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed begging bread. I think it's interesting. He says his seed right? Uh, who is the seed? Well, the righteous, the good man. It's the seed. Isn't that neat? We're the seed of the Lord. You know, we're, the, we're his seed. We're that godly seed, right? And God is not, I, and, and David's saying, I have never seen uh, the righteous man or his seed begging bread. And, uh, and, and you could say, you know, hey, but I, I don't know. I've seen this person. He was in bad uh, condition. You know, he was very poor or whatever. And uh, yeah, well, here's the thing. God is going to lead his, uh, his people and their family, their offspring, right? He's going to lead them in, uh, uh, to, to what they need. 
It says, I've never seen them begging bread. And I'll say this, I've seen a lot of Christians, people trying to serve the Lord, and they've had rough times. And they can't hardly get through, and they don't know what they're going to do next. Yeah, but they've never, God's always come through and always provided for them. They never got to a point where there just is no hope, right? He'll get you through. You just keep following Him. And, uh, and that's something that we can be thankful for, that He's provided everything that we need. Look at Philippians 4 now. Philippians 4, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, and now at the last your care of me hath flourished again, wherein ye were also careful, but ye lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased, and I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things, I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. And so this is the, the mindset of Paul. You know what he was? He was kind of Pollyanna. <laughs> he had a Pollyanna type mind. He's like, hey, if it's, things are bad, I'm just going to wait for the times that they're good. And I'm just going to enjoy what I can uh, while I can. So let's let's play the glad the Pollyanna glad game real quick, okay? I started out by mentioning some hard times that we're going through in 2020, and let me let me just uh, mention a few of those. I said the virus has got our has made our nation insane, and it's divided our country. Hey, we got liberals in the White House now <laughs> again. And we got all these things, and we're looking at what's going to happen in our, in our nation, what's going to happen, and we're thinking about all these kinds of things. But I choose to see this as an opportunity, look at this, for lukewarm Christians to become either cold or hot. Right? Lukewarm Christians are going to be you know, put to the test, and some of them are going to say, hey, you know what, it's time to stand up and start doing some things for the Lord. It's time to start, you know, to stop just living in our luxury and just trying to, uh, you know, just enjoy the good times or whatever. And it's time to start out uh, getting out there and doing what God's called us to do, making some changes, convincing people about some of their uh, their evil ways. And and uh, in this time, I believe that this is a good opportunity for Christians. to. And, you know, God's always used rough times. And I, I hope we don't have to go through any major persecution in the next you know, four or eight years, whatever, but uh, we do know it's coming eventually. <laughs> right? But I hope that we don't have to do that. But you know, every time in the Bible where God's people are put under persecution and trial and tribulation, what happens? They come out doing more works for the Lord, seeing more people saved, growing in, uh, in grace for Him. And this is what I believe is going to happen, okay? So this is what I'm looking for in uh, our society today. I think it's a good thing. Man, I said that when people were saying, hey, you got to vote for Trump. And I was like, you know, what if God wants to use? I mean, I, I hate to play this game because I understand I'm standing up for certain views and I'm against abortion and I'm against all that kind of stuff. But I'm like, well, yeah, but what if God wants to use the president, you know, just like he would use Nebuchadnezzar to take people into captivity or whatever to bring about a little bit of a revival and <laughs> everything in his people? What if God wants to use bad situation for our country to get Christians into action. And I remember people got so mad at me for saying that. How could you not stand up and, uh, and just uh, tout Trump's praises and everything? But hey, it's all in God's hands. He's the one that I'm concerned about, and he's the one that I want to follow. So I believe God knows exactly where our society is and what we need, and he's going to allow his people to be able to do more works and greater works for the cause of Christ in the coming years. Okay, I mentioned that a lot of friends... We're splitting from each other. A lot of church groups and uh, 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 movements, if you will, are having a lot of division, and they're separating one from another. And I, again, I've said this all along uh, from some particular groups that you're aware of. I've said this all, all along. I see that as a good thing. People thought, what in the world? How could you say that's a good thing? Well, here's why. Because anytime there's a movement 
where everybody gets together and there's one or two guys at the top of that movement, maybe three or four, and they're all like the leaders of that movement, and everybody in that movement is following those guys, that's dangerous, all right? They're losing their independent mindset of local churches having their independent. And I believe God uses these types of divisions to make sure that his people are staying independent, all right? And so I have seen this as a blessing in many ways. These churches, maybe uh, some of the people in their churches were looking to other leaders to determine what they're going to believe. And now through these divisions, people have said, you know what? I've got to submit myself to the local church I'm in. And I've got to listen and learn and grow from the pastor that God's given me and not put my focus on these other groups, but say, hey, what can we do as a church, as a body, and grow together as an independent uh, Baptist church? And I think that that's a good thing. God can use that. God can stop... Um, you know, think, uh, movements from becoming uh, bad things. All right. uh, I also mentioned that three deaths this year. No doubt others coming. You know, we've got a lot of older folks. That from the beginning, I've hated the thought of it, but I know that the older generation is starting to pass on the scene. It's been a bad, it's been an inconvenient time. Death always happens at an inconvenient time, doesn't it? But it's been an inconvenient time of, of our, you know, in our nation and everything. But it happened. And some of these died. But I choose not to be depressed and, oh, no, everybody's dying around me and all this kind of stuff. And I choose to look at the positive. Do you know we had three deaths and we've had exactly three babies born this year? <laughs> it's like God's replacing the older that are passing on. It's inevitable. We all pass on eventually. It's not jo a joyous situation in the sense that we lose people that we love, but it's, it's inevitable. And don't you pr just praise the Lord that good families, good godly people who love the Bible and love the Lord and, and, and tr well, they want to train their children up right, they're having babies, which means that's hope for the future generation. <laughs> I think it's a blessing, a good thing to look at. We got one more on the way. That'd be four. That means we've actually had more lives brought into the world than we lost, <laughs> okay? And hopefully there'll be, uh, there'll be many more. You say, well, you're a Pollyanna. Well, I think that that's a good thing <laughs> to look at the positive uh, that can come out of these things, all right? And, uh, and I believe that that's good to know that our future is uh, it, the Lord's doing a work. He's calling out some Christians to be fervent, to be fired up, to be not lukewarm. Uh, he's also uh, raising up families and allowing them to pass down this to a future generation, okay? It's all in how you look at it. It's all in how you look at it. From one perspective, somebody can find the fault in everything. They can be bitter about everything that happens. They can be depressed, and I'm telling you, I, I've seen it in people, and you're just like, I oh, can you not see all the good things? You're just always looking at the bad things. It can easily happen to anybody, but the Bible tells us what perspective we need to have. The Bible tells us, how to look at things. And uh, let's look, if you would, at 1 Thessalonians, and we'll close with this. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Why don't you go ahead and stand. We'll, say, we'll quote this together. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. And Iola, this was our scripture of the week that we print off in the bulletin. And every service we say it together. So... I'll have you say it uh, with me. We'll all quote it together. 1 Thessalonians 5.18. Ready? Go. In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. Father, we thank you for your word. Thank you for the year 2020. Obviously a lot that we could uh, point to about the negative uh, that we see. And, uh, and certainly we don't make light of people's suffering and their pain and their loss. Uh, we don't make light at the, uh, at the bad uh, that's, that, we, that is present in our society. But Lord, help us to overcome that. You've overcome that, uh, and we've overcome that through Jesus Christ. I pray that you'll help us to look for the positive, be content in whatever state that we're in, and continue to serve you, continue to press on with the right attitude and the right spirit. I pray you give us liberty and grace to do that in Jesus' name. Amen.